Living the Faith podcast, brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media, restoringthefaith.com. Welcome back to another episode of Living the Faith. This is your host, Joe, and I'm joined today by Mr. Hugh Owen. He's the head of the Colby Center for the Study of Creation. How are you today, sir? Very well. Thanks be to God. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. It's an honor to have you here. Um, you've spoken many times in uh, our particular region of the heart of America. Um, so we are happy to have you again. We just got recently connected with you, and we're very glad that you took some time out of your weekend to talk with us. Yes. Thank you. So the topic today that we're going to discuss is creationism. Um, for some people, that might seem... Um, Strange. Uh, some people might say that that is, um, why are we talking about this? Either there are super conservative Catholics and Christians who say, well, of course, we believe that God created the world. And then there are others who would say, mm, expelled, Ben Stein, you know, we, you can't talk about this sort of stuff. This is, this is taboo. Everybody knows, knows how this happened, and it didn't happen the way that the Bible said it happened. So, um, Mr. Owen, would it be possible for you to um, explain us a little bit about yourself and how your life ties into this topic entitled Fiat Creation, the Only Firm Foundation for a Culture of Life? Certainly. Um, My grandfather was a Baptist minister in Wales, and my, my father was brought up in a very good Christian home, But when he went to university in England in the 20s and 30s, his professors enlightened him and taught him that science could now explain everything without God or any supernatural agency. Evolution could explain the origins of man and the universe without any recourse to God or the supernatural. We didn't need the fairy tales in the book of Genesis. And that kind of teaching destroyed my father's faith in Christianity and left him, along with millions of others then and in every generation since then, a a secular humanist. And so he went to work for the United Nations. Uh, He became an assistant secretary general, uh, then co-administrator of the United Nations Development Program. And finally, after 25 years with the United Nations, he was knighted by the Queen of England for his work, and he retired. But he looked at the problems of the world and saw that they were all much worse than when the United Nations was started. Why was this? Well, once again, he turned to the intelligentsia, and once again, they had the answer. They said, it's overpopulation. That is the root cause of all the world's problems. That's why we have economic and social injustice and pollution and all these other problems cut down on the number of people, then we'll have enough to go around. All our problems will be solved. And so once again, my father deferred to the consensus of the intelligentsia, and he accepted to become the first ever Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation at the very time when IPPF changed its position on abortion and became the world's number one provider of abortion as well as contraception and sex education. And he held that position for just about a year when he died unexpectedly of a heart attack in London when I was just 16 years old. Now his death precipitated my conversion to the Catholic faith, which is a story for another time. But suffice it to say that less than two years after my father's death, although I had been brought up with with no church, no Bible, no prayer, nothing, I was baptized, confirmed, and made my first Holy Communion as a Catholic in the Princeton University Chapel where I was enrolled as a freshman. And the reason I share this with the audience is because it was the teaching of evolution as a scientific fact that explained the origins of man and the universe without God and without any supernatural agency that put my father on that trajectory that brought him to that terrible decision to become the first Secretary General of International Planned Parenthood Federation. And when I 
was received into the church, the Catholic chaplains at Princeton University were Jesuit priests, and they gave me the Dutch catechism to learn my Catholic faith, but I call it the Dutch cataclysm because it was this book that totally destroyed the faith of a once great Catholic people who sent a disproportionate number of missionaries all over the world who gave their lives to spread the true faith. And the theme that runs through that Dutch cataclysm from beginning to end is we're in a scientific age. Science has enlightened us. And now with this new scientific understanding, we can understand all the doctrines of our faith in a new and deeper way. And with that very high-sounding theme, they proceed to sow doubt in the mind of the reader about just about every doctrine of the faith, from the uh, doctrine of creation, original sin, and, and everything to the intrinsic evil of, of contraception and everything in between. And when I first was received into the church, I didn't know anything different, and I meekly accepted that this was the true teaching of the church, and that these priests were correct in telling me that Moses, the fathers, the doctors, they didn't have our technology. They didn't have our sophisticated scientific knowledge. Therefore, God had to allow them this, this myth, this poetic account of creation. But now that we had entered into this scientific age with our technology, with our advanced scientific knowledge, now we can really understand how God really made everything come to be through this process of evolution over billions of years. But by the grace of God, over a period of about 15 years, I eventually came to the realization that this, this claim was one of the most preposterous claims ever made by human beings. Because if, if you look at an icon of evolution, such as we see in natural history museums all over the world or biology textbooks, science textbooks all over the world. It's easy to see that evolution is very easy to understand. You don't need to know anything about science. You don't need to know anything about anything. This is why little children are easily indoctrinated to believe in evolution, molecules to man evolution. So I came to the realization that this idea that you have to have this very sophisticated <laughs> scientific knowledge to understand evolution was absurd. And that if God had actually used such a process, he could easily have shown this to Moses and, and, and then the, the great saints and doctors like St. Hildegard of Bingen who were shown the work of creation, he, he would have shown them the evolutionary process. Mm. So the, the whole idea that Moses and the ancients couldn't understand evolution was made even more absurd when I came to the realization that the pagan world was full of evolution, that the fathers went out into a, into a pagan world where evolutionary philosophy was very popular. People like Epicurus and Lucretius had a big following in the patristic age, and they believed that everything came to be over millions and millions of years of the same kinds of natural processes that are going on now. It's nothing new. So obviously, if the fathers, who were so exalted in their intellect as well as in their holiness, and so much closer to the apostles than we are, if they had thought that the Genesis account of creation was something that could be compromised— they would have been the first to say, well, these people are very intelligent. We want to bring them on board. They'll bring the intelligentsia, the social leaders with them. This doesn't matter how God created. We just need to establish that God created. How he did it is not important. But they didn't do that because every single one of the fathers would have died for the literal historical truth of the sacred history of Genesis. And so... My personal life is very much bound up with this apostolate in the sense that my father, I'm convinced, along with literally hundreds of millions of other people who were brought up in a Christian milieu, would never have lost their faith 
if they had not believed that science had established as an irrefutable fact, to use the words of Théard de Chardin, that molecules turned into human bodies through a natural process of evolution, through the same kinds of material processes that are going on now. Wow, that's very interesting. There are two things that jumped out to me when you were talking about this. First of all, the the Dutch cataclysm that was provided to you by, the, unfortunately, the Jesuits who were once such a great order and now one of a, 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 just a horrible force for evil in today's world just yes. give, due to their fall and due to their heresies that they've promoted throughout the, quite a while, in fact. Um, but one thing that jumped out to me, of course, these people who, you know, proclaim, you know, evolution and, you know, any other explanation that involves not being God uh, who created the world. But, um, of course, they wouldn't accept the Genesis account, but it is so reminiscent even of this particularly that um, in the garden, how the, the serpent tells Eve, you know, if only you could know you could be like God. And now it just, again, one more revolution, one more spin of the wheel of another age where we say, wow, if we could just know and knowledge could set us free and we could know all these wonderful things. And then, of course, be pushed right back into error, caught loss uh, of mass loss of faith throughout the world during this age of enlightenment, um, et cetera. So that that's just really, really impressive from that. So obviously we know as as Catholics um, and as conservative Christians, that God did create the world. This this is not a, a, a an epiphany for us. We we know these things, but how uh, how do we sum that up traditionally and encompassingly um, the teaching of the Church on creation? Yes, well, the teaching of all the apostles, fathers, doctors, popes, and councils in their authoritative teaching is clear. And it's summed up very beautifully in the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent, which wanted to summarize the dogmas of the faith for pastors so that they could teach their illiterate people the dogmas of the faith. And this was the gold standard for teaching and preaching for 350 years. It's still authoritative. If you look up the explanation of the first article of the Creed in the Roman Catechism, you'll see it teaches that the divinity created all things in the beginning. He spoke and they were made. He commanded and they were created. That's the teaching. He created all things in the beginning, not just some things that turned into everything else over long ages of time. No, it's clear. He created all things in the beginning. And how did he do it? Not through a natural process like a supernova explosion. He did it by fiat by speaking, by willing them into existence. And the Catechism goes on to explain this is how he created the heavens and the earth. This is how he created all the different kinds of plants. This is how he created the heavenly bodies. This is how he created the creatures of the sea and the air and the land. This is how he created Adam, body and soul, and Eve from Adam's side. And the Catechism sums this up by saying that if the pastor wants to explain to his people how God created the world, all he has to do, they say, is refer to the sacred history of Genesis and teach it to the people. And so this is the teaching of the church that was handed down from the apostles. And contrary to what is taught in most Catholic seminaries and universities all over the world, all the fathers, including St. Augustine, would have died for the fact that Genesis is a sacred history. St. Augustine says, Genesis is not poetry like the Song of Songs. He says it is history like the Book of Chronicles. And a history is is an account of what actually happened. Of course, the sacred history of Genesis is also a foreshadowing that has many future fulfillments and has many spiritual meanings that are built upon the literal meaning. But the literal meaning is the basis, as St. Thomas teaches and as the Catechism quotes St. Thomas in teaching, for all other senses of Scripture. So this idea, which is found almost everywhere in Catholic academia, that Genesis is poetry or Genesis is even a myth, this has no basis whatsoever 
in the tradition of the church. It's a sacred history, and it teaches that God created all the different kinds of creatures by fiat for man. We would say for Adam and Eve in view of the Incarnation and the Immaculate Conception. And when God finished creating all the different kinds of creatures for us, that constituted what St. Thomas in the Summa calls the first perfection of the universe, which he defines as the completeness of the universe at its first founding. So this is very different from the alternative views that are being taught to most of our young people, that creation was spread out over hundreds of millions and billions of years, and God created one kind of thing, and then that was replaced by something else and something else and something else. This is a total perversion of what was handed down to us because God created everything for us. And the first perfection of the universe means that every single kind of creature existed perfect according to its nature together with Adam and Eve, for Adam and Eve, right at the beginning of creation. And that first perfection of the universe was free not only from human death, but from deformity, disease, extinction, struggle for existence, or any kind of disorder of this kind. And it was therefore the original sin that brought not only the human death, but deformity, disease, extinctions, struggle for existence into the world. All the alternative accounts for the origins of man in the universe that are being taught in Catholic schools and universities and seminaries all over the world today make God responsible for deliberately bringing into his creation the death, the deformity, the disease, the extinctions, the struggle for existence. And this is a terrible blasphemy against the character of our all-good, all-loving God. And this is the principal reason why we are determined to fight against these errors, because the character of God is at stake. And this is what St. Thomas teaches in the Summa Contra Gentilis. He says, the opinion of those who say that it doesn't matter, it's a matter of indifference, what you believe about creation, as long as you have the right idea of God, he says, that is notoriously false. Because an error about creation always leads to an error in one's understanding of God. Wow, that's fascinating. So to, to help, help me walk through this one more kind of time, more simplistically. So we're making a distinction between fiat creation and let's just, for lack of a better term, say evolutionary creation. Let's just say God created this big blob that's floating around in some, you know, in space and, and then it explodes and then God, you know, kind of guides this matter or the matter had the, his guidance embedded in it somehow that it would eventually become all these things, et cetera, and so on and so forth. But we're saying that it has to have been made. Everything must have been made individually, every species, et cetera, um, be made, uh, including man himself and then woman, of course, from the, from his side, that's important because if it had been done the other way, that meant that there would have had to be evil as, as a result of a lack of a good, right? So you like a, a, a five-legged elephant or this thing or that thing, right? And then some, finally nature balances out and decides on four, but there would have had to be all these evil mutations. My wife is a nurse, um, and or was a nurse, rather, and she was saying, you know, it's kind of funny how, you know, we talk about, in when we talk about science, um, you, you know, in this evolutionary format, everybody's like, oh, you know, the mutations, all the glorious mutations, this, that, and the other, but basically in every other kind of form of medicine or whatnot, mutation is a bad thing. It's not a good thing. Yes. So, so this is, this is why this is so important, I suppose, about why it's not, we, we cannot be ambivalent as to the type of design. Yes. And let me be a, a little more precise about the main alternatives to the true Catholic teaching on creation so that everybody in the audience can understand this more clearly. There are, there are basically two different alternative accounts for the origins of man in the universe that are widely taught in Catholic academia. One is theistic evolution, but this has a variety of forms, and it's important to understand 
kind of the spectrum. At one end of the spectrum of theistic evolutionary belief is the view of Dr. Ken Miller at Brown University, author of Finding Darwin's God, a very uh, influential Catholic theistic evolutionist. And Dr. Miller holds that about 13.7 billion years ago, God created some matter and some natural laws, and from that point forward, everything just developed on its own through the same kinds of material processes that are going on now. He even believes that life came from non-life through a material process of evolution. And then he holds that at some point, after about 13.7 billion years of natural evolution, God infused a human soul into a subhuman primate, and that became the first human being. So that's one end of the spectrum, and that is a very popular view in Catholic academia today. At the other end of the theistic evolutionary spectrum is the very popular view of Teilhard de Chardin. And this is an extremely popular view, sadly, tragically, among consecrated religious in this country and throughout the world. And Teilhard de Chardin identifies God with the evolutionary process to the extent that for Teilhard de Chardin, Christ is not our Lord Jesus Christ born of the Blessed Virgin. It's the cosmic Christ, which is in a continuous state of evolution, and everyone is a member of this mystical body, if you will, of the cosmic Christ, which is evolving towards an omega point in the future when there will be a one-world government and a, and a one-world religion, which we would have to say is, is actually the religion of Antichrist. But in between these two extremes, you will have other you know, variations on the theme. But what all of these views have in common, and this is what's most important to understand, is they all deny the creation by God in the beginning of a perfectly complete, harmonious, and beautiful universe that was created for us. Wherever you fall on that spectrum, you deny the first perfection of the universe. And this is extremely important, because if you deny the first perfection of the universe, then perfection lies in the future. Utopia is in the future. We're evolving towards something that has never existed on Earth. And this is the very essence of the revolutionary mentality. Whereas the true mind of Christ is one of restoration. This is why we don't speak about revolution or evolution to something that never existed. St. Paul in the letter to Ephesians speaks about res restoration of all things in Christ, because we're restoring the original order that existed in the beginning of creation. And of course, through the Holy Church, our Lord wants to bring that to its final perfection at the end of time. So there is a final perfection, as St. Thomas teaches in the Summa, but there's a first perfection. And what we are doing if we cooperate with the grace of God as members of the mystical body of Christ, is we are cooperating in the restoration of all things in Christ back to that original harmony that existed in the beginning. Now, the other position that is not as popular but is more popular in traditional Catholic circles is usually called progressive creation. And those who hold to this view reject evolution. They, they say correctly that it's philosophically absurd to think that a reptile could turn into a bird or the body of a monkey could turn into the body of a human being. So far, so good. But unfortunately, the people who hold to this view accept the geology that was uh, brought forward by James Hutton and Charles Lyell and their disciples, which created the whole framework for Charles Darwin and the evolu bi biological evolutionists. And, um, and then after them, for the Big Bang cosmologists. Because all of these people, contrary to what you might imagine, if you think about this logically, simply worked within the framework that was handed to them by the geologists. And this 
uh, geology of Lyell and, and Hutton and their disciples was created without any kind of empirical science to support it. And in fact, cutting-edge sedimentology, which is the empirical science studying how sediments are laid down in the real world, has totally refuted the ideas of Lyell and Hutton and is 100% consistent with the traditional understanding of creation and the history of mankind and, and, and of the earth. But these progressive creationists hold that evolution did not occur, but that the billions of years did occur, and that what happened is God intervened periodically over these hundreds of millions of years to create supernaturally the different kinds of creatures, and they would argue that this is what we see in the fossil record. But these people, too, with the best of intentions— are also denying the first perfection of the universe. Because if you accept the fossil record as Lyle and Hutton and Darwin and their disciples accepted it, then you are also accepting that God created a world in which there was death and deformity and disease and extinctions and struggle for existence. And this is not the world that God created according to the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers. So unwittingly, while trying to combat the errors of evolution, the progressive creationists have actually accepted the same framework that the evolutionists accepted to begin with, and they have compromised, if not actually blasphemed, the true character of God. So the true doctrine is one which holds that God created all the different kinds of creatures supernaturally, but not spread out over these mythical billions of years, but rather right at the beginning of creation. And the fathers and doctors basically give us two alternatives. The overwhelming majority held that there were literally six days of creation in which God created the heavens and the earth and the seas and all they contain, just as he wrote with his own finger on the tablets of stone, which Moses gave to the people the Ten Commandments. Or there is the minority view of St. Augustine that it was an instantaneous creation which was then revealed to the angels in segments which correspond to the six days of creation. But neither of those views is compatible with theistic evolution or progressive creation. That's, that's a really fascinating uh, thing to say with regards to we are constantly progressing towards a perfection that of course the the hor- horrible implication that is embedded in that that I've never considered because I I was always like well really does it matter that much you know how this actually came to be the fact is that God created it yeah I I can't I'm not a scientist I can't tell you if it happened this way or it happened that way but it seems actually that I'm I, I I'm need to believe it happened in at least one of, of these two, these two ways as opposed, and it does matter that I actually think through this and that I actually be like, Oh, right. Because one of the horrible implications that occurred to me right now is, is that if we have evolved from either from one end of the spectrum, from pond scum to a monkey, to a man, or we have the, even this progressive evolution that you talk about where men are evolving to towards in, in a kind of a micro evolution towards this particular uh to end if we're continuing to evolve and it's it, it's striving towards this constant perfection that it's it's that has not happened yet as you say that would mean that Christ himself and his body was still evolving and so he himself was not even perfection i that that was that was a the, the, that was a horrible implication to think of that happening like that yes yes and and there's no doubt that the most terrible consequences of the abandonment of the traditional doctrine of creation are the theological and spiritual consequences that affect on the souls, especially of, of, of priests and consecrated, but also the lay faithful, as they've been led to believe that what the Church taught authoritatively for almost 2,000 years— was not correct, that the Bible is not inerrant, that 
in order to understand Genesis correctly, God did not raise up saints and scholars from within the bosom of the Catholic Church, but rather had to raise up godless people like Charles Lyell and T.H. Huxley, who hated the Catholic Church and wanted to destroy her, and had to use them to enlighten our own church leaders so that they could understand how the world actually came to be. And if you, if you really want to understand the roots of the current crisis, the unprecedented current crisis of faith and morals, you have to understand this. Because people who think everything was great until Vatican II, they have not studied their history. Already in the 20s, in the 30s, in the 40s, seminaries were full of professors who were beginning to teach the seminarians, the future priests, the future bishops, the future popes. Genesis is just a myth. Science has enlightened us. What the church taught before in these matters was wrong. We have to be open to correction from these experts in natural science. And this destroyed the piety, the filial piety, and the, uh, the spirituality of so many future priests and bishops because they no longer could believe that Holy Mother Church was truly an infallible teacher, that sacred scripture was truly inerrant in everything that she teaches. And this is what set the stage for all the aberrations, all the abominations that have occurred in the last 50 or 60 years. But there are many other uh, catastrophic consequences that have followed from the abandonment of the traditional doctrine of creation. We live in the Western world in the anti-culture of death. And yet, it, it is rare, extremely rare, to hear any Catholic identify evolution as a serious matter in relation to the anti-culture of death. And this just shows how successful the devil has been in deceiving us as to what's really the fundamental doctrine that undergirds this whole anti-culture. Because the reality is, if you take any of the, the principal abominations of our time, uh, unnatural vice, uh, transgenderism, um, abort- a nomen on demand, uh, all these things, if you actually delve down below the surface, you'll discover that evolution, the, the alleged fact, the scientific fact of evolution, is always there to provide the appearance of a scientific basis for all of these errors. And it, it, it is true from, from decades of experience with my colleagues all over the world that when you show a person that this foundation is nothing, that evolution is totally bogus, that it has no scientific basis whatsoever, the whole foundation of the anti-culture of death is destroyed. And what the devil does Of course, he doesn't want people to fight against unnatural vice. He doesn't want people to fight against transgenderism. But he's much happier to have us fight against unnatural vice or transgenderism or any number of abominations without ever going down to the foundation that undergirds them all. Because he knows that if we win a battle against transgenderism, some other abomination will just rise up from the same rotten soil. But if you destroy the foundation, the whole thing collapses. Then all that these people are left with is force. Then it comes out in the open. We want abortion because we want it. That's it. We want to be able to be whatever gender we want to be because we want it. That will not go over with the ordinary person, even if they are very badly educated. It's this evolution foundation that is always there to prop up all of the propaganda that justifies all of these other abominations. So we have to get 
our people to understand the foundation has to be identified, it has to be exposed, it has to be destroyed, and then the whole thing will collapse. Wow. I, 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 again, I, this, this is an epiphany to me that this has such, this level of an impact, just this scientific, uh, what they call, st- still call theory. <laughs> this blows my mind that we are still talking about something as if it were a law, and yet we're talking against a supposed theory that nobody's allowed to talk about, and that it actually has so many more implications than I even personally would have ever even thought it implied with that. So the, what what is it that we can do to restore the true Catholic doctrine of creation as a foundation of the gospel so that we can be uh, uh, we can go against this culture, fight for our culture, against this anti-culture. Well, uh, for the last three years, we have been working on a 16-part DVD series featuring outstanding uh, teachers and experts in theology, philosophy, and natural science, people like Dr. Wolfgang Smith, uh, Father Chad Ripperger, and many others. And um, this will be, God willing, available for distribution by October 1st, the Feast of St. Therese of Lisieux, the patroness of the missions. And one of the things that I would encourage everyone in the audience to do is to subscribe to our free email newsletter. You can easily subscribe on the Colbe website, www.colbecenter.org. And then we will let you know when this DVD series is available because This is the most comprehensive defense of the true Catholic doctrine of creation from the perspective of theology, philosophy, and natural science that has ever been created in the video medium. And the videography is outstanding, as well as the content. It's also available, uh, going to be available with a teacher's guide and uh, a discussion guide. So, if you can't get permission to have a seminar or, 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 or a meeting in a parish hall or in a school or in a university, you can have a meeting in your own home. But this DVD series is a way to get the truth out in a very powerful and persuasive way. And not only the defense of the true doctrine of creation, but a very comprehensive refutation of all of the scientific arguments for molecules to man evolution. It deals with the cosmology, the geology, the biology, the genetics, and and everything in between. So that's one thing that I would encourage everybody to do. The other thing is, we don't expect you to listen to a program like this and, and take our word for what we're saying. That would be ridiculous. But what we ask you to do is go to our website, We have a tremendous number of free resources there in various media. Take advantage of them. Make your own investigation. Look at what the other groups have to say and make a judgment for yourself. But if you conclude, as I believe that you will, that what we are defending is the truth and is the very foundation of our faith, please get into the fight and Make this a priority in your in your prayer life, something that you offer up prayers and sacrifices for, that you remember at Holy Mass and in your Holy Rosary, and spread the word. Because this truth needs to be spread, in the Western world at least, from the bottom up. In Africa, it's a different story. We are concentrating a lot of our resources, especially in Uganda, because there... There's much more faith in the Catholic community, and we have a lot of receptivity from bishops, from priests, from seminary professors, as well as from the lay faithful. But here and throughout the Western world, obviously there are, there are wonderful exceptions, but generally speaking, those who control the schools, the seminaries, the universities, they will not even allow this kind of a presentation to be given, nor will they have a debate. We've had a debate challenge on our website for almost 20 years, and we've only been able to find two takers in that entire period of time. So please make your own investigation, and if you conclude that what we are defending is the truth and is 
the very foundation of our faith, get into the fight and help us to spread the truth and and especially remember us in in your prayers and in your sacrifices. And if when enough of us do this, we'll reach a certain critical mass. And just as in that story of Hans Christian Andersen about the emperor's new clothes, you remember the the emperor was naked and, and yet nobody wanted to be the one to say that he wasn't wearing any clothes. And then a little child uh, came out and said it, and then little by little other people started to join in. Well, this is what's starting to happen within the Catholic community, but we have to reach a certain critical mass. And there's going to come a point, and I believe by the grace of God and through the prayers of the Blessed Virgin, it's not going to be too far in the future when there will be enough of us that all of a sudden everybody is going to join in and say, the emperor of evolution is not wearing any clothes. Let's get back to the faith of our fathers. Thank you very much, sir, for your time. We really appreciate this time that we spent with you. This has been, I got to tell you, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very, especially the one, the, the third kind of evolution that you're talking about with the progressive evolution, this really blew my mind. This was really an amazing uh, insight into something that I really did not think that I would consider myself to really think that much about. Yes. Um, I, I just want to believe what the church believes. It's pretty pretty simple. I want to go to heaven, and I want to believe what the church believes so that I can know God, so that I can love and serve him yes. more. And as we say here on Restoring the Faith, that this is this is what we're called to, knowing, loving, and serving God. If you don't know God uh, and you don't seek to know him more, you can't seek to love him more, and you can't seek to serve him more. Yes. You have to grow in all of these things. So, you know, I, I, I dealt with this at, at a lot of times at, at work where people are talking about, oh, well, you know, you conservative Catholics, you you red Republicans, you know, I'm like, I'm not even a Republican. You don't even want to know what I am. But the, the, the point the, the point is, is that they're like, well, you know, y'all just you don't believe in science. Y'all don't like want to think about reason and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, you know, if you people had only an ounce of an idea and actually weren't misinformed by history, you would find that the most brilliant minds in science are Catholics. Yes. In fact, there aren't a whole lot after Christ came of people who made tremendous as as more tremendous breakthroughs as catholics galileo galileo was a was a catholic okay now he became a heretic because he tried to hold a different position than what was approved by the church but the fact of the matter is is it was a lie that he was believing in all these people were catholics who were these great scientists we love science because science is just a study there's many different kinds of sciences, and the sciences that we're talking about here having to do with uh, you know, the natural science uh, or science about the, you know, the world and how it came to be and all this sort of stuff, these are all beautiful ways in which we can know God more. And if we believe something that is not what is actually true, then that can actually, like uh, as, as you demonstrated just by, through your words, uh, Mr. Owen, that um, we can actually... Uh, we can lose our love for God. That can that can go down our 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 service to God. We we can't. How are we how are we serving God as a world when we have transgenders and all these other people running around saying that I want to do this because well I want to do it. Well, guess what? You're not God. We're all called to be God, uh, to be servants of God in this yes. world today. And this is just one more way in which we can appreciate the beauty. of of God, his magnificence and his love for us and giving this to us. We really appreciate your time again, sir. It's been really fantastic being with you. Appreciate the time. God bless all of you. Thank you. God bless. Podcast brought to you by Restoring the Faith Media. Restoringthefaith.com